Beatlemania, Ranger 6, launched by NASA, carrying television cameras, crash-landed on the moon. Cassius Clay beats Sonny Liston. The year is 1964, and you could also buy this Lark Daytona convertible brand new at any Studebaker showroom. But before getting into all of it, I'm Jay. Welcome to What It's Like, the automotive channel that puts the spotlight on cars not often talked about. We cover the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars, and cars that are frankly being forgotten. Talk design, history, specs of these rolling works of art. Post five times a week. If that sounds like a channel that you will totally dig, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. 1964 Studebaker model lineup, but before getting into all that, let's talk about the climate over at Studebaker. In 1963, Studebaker would close their South Bend plant, which was huge because that's where it all started, clear back in 1852. But to be honest, Studebaker goes back even further than that. People get all wrapped up in Oldsmobile being the oldest American company. Studebaker beat Oldsmobile by 50 years. Studebaker would build wagons and coaches before moving to the horseless carriages, electric cars, and then gas cars. December 9th, 1963, Studebaker President Sherwood Egbert was fired. The last of the Avantes, Hawks, and Larks were assembled on December 26th of 63. The engine foundry would stay open until the contract expired in May of 64. Studebaker still had one plant that was open in Canada. Studebaker, trying to free up some money, decided to sell Avanti. They sold it to Leo Newman and Nate Altman, who were both longtime Studebaker Packard dealers. They would receive the car in 1965, and they would sell the car as the Avanti 2. The rights to Studebaker trucks and vast stockpile of parts and accessories and the plant, the South Bend plant itself, was sold to Kaiser Jeep. You have to remember the South Bend plant was a staple for the South Bend community, providing some 7,000 jobs. Kaiser buying the plant brought some of those jobs back to the community. Kaiser would use the plant to make military vehicles, but it was only for a very short period of time. Henry J. Kaiser died in 67. The plant and the rights to Kaiser and Jeep and all of it would be sold to AMC. Studebaker did make cars in 65 and 66 in Canada, but they are super rare with only like 6,000 total units being produced in 66. Once all the Studebaker engines were spoken for, they used Chevy engines like the 230 in line six or the 283 V8. And so just to be clear, Studebaker didn't go bankrupt. They just stopped building cars. 1964 Studebaker model lineup, you had the Lark, which wasn't technically called the Lark, which could be had as the Challenger, Commander, Daytona, Cruiser, Wagoneer, Gran Turismo Hawk, Avanti, Champ Trucks, Truck Line. Studebaker offered the Lark from 1959 to 1966 in three generations. 1964 falls in the third generation, which had a production run from 1964 to 1966. Designed by Brooke Stevens with a shoestring budget, Lark name only was used on early Challenger and Commander models. The Commander model and the Challenger model only had single headlights. Dual headlights were optional, and the Lark name was totally phased out. Studebaker did receive a redesign, so 63 on top, 64 on the bottom, starting in the front. Gone is the Mercedes-esque grille on the 63 in favor of a more slender grille section. Also, look at the hood. It has a lower profile, giving the 64 a sleeker look. 64 just has a sporty overall look over the 63. Bumpers, grill, front fascia, hood ornaments, all different. Turn signal placement is located below the bumper on the 64 versus just below the headlights above the bumper on the 63. Moving to the side profile, just pretend the 63 is a convertible. I couldn't find a picture of a side shot 63 for whatever reason. Front overhang differ between models. Bumpers aren't just styled different, but are also mounted in different places. The 63 looks curvier in the fenders and body panels, whereas the 64 has more of a straight appearance. Moldings are different. Rocker 
darker trim and gravel guard found on the 64 that isn't found on the 63. Notice the rear wheel wells. They aren't rounded on both the 63 and 64, but looking back at the front at the wheel well situation, that is interesting. Looking at the rear, completely new and different design. Bumpers, lights, backup lights, all different between these two. Gas filler placement is in the same place. Taking a gander inside at the dash, which one do you like better? In the comment section below, let's talk specs. 190 inches long, 71.5 inches wide, 58 and a half inches tall. It rides a wheelbase of 109 inches. It weighs 3,090 pounds. Price, $2,660, which is equivalent to you. Spending $26,180, 32 cents in the year 2023. Total 1964 Studebaker production was 36,697 units, of which total Daytona was 11,201 units, and of that number, total convertible. So this is where things get a bit confusing. There was two numbers. There was 647 and 55, so a total of 702. I don't know what the difference is between those two numbers. Moving on to engines. It's important to note that different models offered different engines. This was the base engine for the Daytona 1959 cubic inch displacement V8 4.2 liters. It was good for 180 horsepower at 4,500 RPM, 260 pound feet of torque at 2,300 RPM. Compression eight and a half to one featured five main bearings. When backed with a three speed manual transmission, zero to 60 could be had in 9.9 .9 seconds. Theoretical top speed 111 miles per hour Average fuel consumption, 15 and a half miles to the gallon. Moving on, first optional engine, if you wanted a little bit more power, baby, the Thunderbolt V8 289, 4.7 liters. It was good for 210 horsepower with a two barrel carburetor. Four barrel carburetor bumped horsepower output up to 225 horsepower, 4,500 RPM, 300 pound feet of torque with a two barrel carburetor, 305 pound feet of torque with a four barrel carburetor at 2,400 RPM. Five main bearings when backed with a three speed manual transmission. Zero to 60 could be had in 8.3 seconds. Theoretical top speed 114 miles per hour. Average fuel consumption 13.6 miles to the gallon. These are just baseline numbers, too. Moving on, and maybe this is where the 55 figure came from. It was possible to get the Jet Thrust Avanti powered 289. It was offered from January of 64 to October. This one is called the R1. Our featured car is powered by the R1. 289 cubic inch displacement, V8, 4.7 liters. It was good for 240 horsepower at 5,000 RPM, 320 pound-feet of torque at 3,400 RPM. Compression, 9 to 1. When backed with a 3-speed manual transmission, 0 to 60 could be had in 7.6 seconds. Theoretical top speed, 122 miles per hour while achieving a 13.3 mile per gallon average. Moving on to the biggest and baddest engine on offer, the R2. The R2 was a jet thrust supercharged 289 V8, 4.7 liters, one horsepower per cubic inch, 289 horsepower, 5,000 RPM, 370 pound feet of torque at 3,400 RPM. Compression, nine to one, five main bearings. When backed with a three speed automatic transmission, zero to 60 could be had in 6.9 seconds. Theoretical top speed, 119 miles per hour. Average fuel consumption, 10.9 miles to the gallon. For those that never heard of Studebaker's R-Series, they were Studebaker's Super Series. They produced R1 through R4, but the R3 and R4 were only available on the Avanti, and they're super rare. And they were the hottest Studebaker's ever built. They were built for super performance, factory equipped with rear axle, radius, rods, rear stabilizer bar, twin traction, disc brakes in the front, HD springs, and shocks all around, bucket seats, front seat belts, four-ply tires, and side grills identifications. Floor carpeting, but you had your choice of two transmissions, either the power shift automatic or the four-speed manual transmission. Any Studebaker that isn't equipped with the R1 series engine could have their choice of six different transmissions and seven different rear end ratios. 
So let's talk chassis. I wasn't able to find a whole lot of information that I like to show, but it's a body on frame construction. And just know that Studebaker used kingpins until the day that they stopped making cars. Let's talk styling. Just look at how the stainless pops with this color. How these bumpers are designed. Look at how this comes down and how these overriders, bumperettes, meet this bumper. You can't find a blue on the car. So look at how these headlights sit back inside here, how they're recessed. So check out the design of this hood, front fascia area, grill. This one was the national first prize champion the year that I was born. It's got a nice R1 badge there. Studebaker emblem up on top of the hood. So just notice how this bevels back, how this is all sculpted in. Coming down the side here, just notice how this is all channeled out. How the wheel well flares. Check out these mag wheels. The owner told me that these were a stock dealership added accessory option. Also, check out this car has mag wheels with white walls and it yeah. looks good. Look at how rounded this is. The windshield how these mirrors are attached. This is Avanti powered R1. Comes down. Look at the lines here and the sheet metal on the side. This is my favorite design aspect of this design. Look at how this wheel well flares out. Lots of lines going on. Just look at the lines going on with the rear design. Studebaker. But notice how this protrudes over top of this. Gas filler cap. Brake lights, backup lights how this protrudes outward. So just look at this door panel and all the materials going on, all the bright work separating color. Down here it's like a, it's all vinyl it feels like. This is just a texturized vinyl at the Did bottom. The door lock, armrest, door handle to pull the door shut. window crank for the big window it's got vent windows door handle to get out coming down inside the pedal box down here emergency brake high beam switch right behind it brake release up top there's a nice light so you can see everything down here hood release brake gas pedal just take a look at this interior here's what over the hood looks like here's what first person over the hood looks like on to the button switches and knobs all the way left defrost notice that on is down off is up which is super interesting to me three gauge pods sit directly in front of the driver in the very first pod coolant temperature oil pressure amp meter gasoline gauge all gauges this is 1964 so that's really cool to see headlights and instrument panel lights in the center gauge speedometer odometer just below it Drive modes read park, neutral, drive, low, reverse, clock, lighter, fan, wipers, ignition, heater, slider on is down, which I still find is super interesting, Studebaker radio. Up above there are sun visors and they look like this. Got a nice rear view mirror there. There's sun visor over here for the passenger. Ashtray is located here. 
And I just wanted to show you that it's padded right there. The ashtray is padded. There's also another ashtray right here. I think the console has been added. These seats are super plushy, super comfortable seats. On to the glove box test. Here is our test subject. Here's my hand for reference. Here's the glove box in question. And this one's got the Studebaker vanity mirror set up, as well as the original owner's manual. It's pretty sweet. It pulls out like a drawer. And then the mirror goes up like that. And that's how that looks. So it fits in there, but it's not gonna shut because of uh, that. Okay, so we opened the hood from the inside and then there's a second catch right here. Just pick up on it like that. And it locks into place. Notice the little hinges. Look at this engine. Look how beautiful this 289 is. It's got an alternator, the horn. One horn mounted right there. Radiator. The fan. Notice the fan has a clutch on it. Clutch fan. No uh, fan shroud. Oil and transmission dipsticks on this side. It's got power steering. 12 volt system. This is for the uh, windshield wipers, windshield washer, solenoid. It's got a dual master cylinder. AFB four barrel. AFB four barrel carburetor. Cool. Electric wipers. Look at the hood insulator. It only goes up halfway. On the positive side, depending on the day and who you talk to, these look better than a 63. They are rare. This is the only one that I've ever seen in the wild. Perfect size car, super comfortable seats, good performance, especially with the R1 and R2 white whale rarity of those cars. Against it, they are easily mistaken for other cars. Trim parts and body replacement parts can be hard to get a hold of. All right, now it's time for Would You Rather two scenarios today. In the very first scenario, would you rather have a 1964 Falcon convertible or 1964 Studebaker Daytona convertible or... 1964 Plymouth Valiant Signet convertible. I'm gonna leave this here for a minute. If you need more time, feel free, pause the video. Moving to the second scenario, which is a bit more out of the box. 1964 AMC Rambler convertible or 1964 Studebaker Daytona convertible or 1964 Mercury Comet Caliente convertible. I'm gonna leave this here for a minute. If you need more time, feel free, pause the video. Now it's time for Name That Tune. First person to give both the name of the band and song title correctly in the comment section will have their comment pinned to the top of it. That one's out of left field. Hopefully somebody will get it. Anyway, thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. If you'd like to get in touch with me, shoot me a comment in the comment section below or check out our Facebook group that correlates with this YouTube channel by clicking the link in the description. If you don't have Facebook and would like to reach me, send me an email. Like I said, all of it will be linked in the description below. Just know I appreciate all of the support and until next time, toodaloo!